Just talk about that. Just talk about that. All right, how many of you do not know who I am? I'm sitting up here talking and, and it's like, okay, how many of you do not even, uh, you know, why am I here, right? <laughs> Okay, my name is Michael Golden. You probably caught that right out the front door. Um, I have been in the commercial art industry, like I said, since the late 60s, but I've been in uh, comic books and multimedia entertainment since the mid-70s. Uh, I created Rogue from the X-Men, Bucky O'Hare, the NOM, which became the Tour of Duty TV show. I don't know if anybody here saw that. Um, created the, uh, or redesigned, let me rephrase that, redesigned the uh, Beast Wars Megatron. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yep, that's a quite all right. A lot of people don't know that. The reason I was the redesigner is because back then they did not have computer-aided design. All of the Transformers were designed out of people's heads. Now the difference is, is that in Japan they do not have the taboos on certain body parts that we have here in the West. So that when they brought the Transformers to the West, they had to have some of these characters redesigned to have those body parts redesigned. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And uh, so I was, I was one of the guys that they hired to redesign them for the cartoons and stuff like that. Um, I was a senior special projects editor over at DC Comics and I was also Marvel senior art director. Uh, my commercial clients are everybody from Bandai to Disney to uh, Philips to NASA to NASCAR. Uh, I designed the, the Tide NASCAR back in the 80s. Uh, I was on the design team for the Viagra NASCAR. My input was make it blue. Uh, <laughs> Does anybody here still write checks? I didn't think so. Uh, but back when everybody wrote checks to pay your bills, there was a company down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia called Harland, and they designed almost all the checks in North America, and I was one of the designers for them. Uh, I have done work for Harley Davidson, uh, AMC. Um, oh, gee, you can see my car from here. Um, <laughs> See that pretty little Camaro sitting over there between the trees? That's mine. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't have pointed that out. Now you're all going to go over there and scratch it, aren't you? Uh, let's see. Um, well, that's sort of my resume. Um, I'm just totally awesome <laughs> and humble, too. All right. Uh, the majority of my work, when you're looking for it, you'll find is Marvel. Uh, only because when I worked for DC, they had a financial issue. And I was one of the guys they let go, and they've regretted it ever since. You believe that? I've got some land in <laughs> Florida for you. Uh, but that's just about it, I think. I, you know, I'm probably missing a whole lot of things. I, um, I worked with Jackie Chan. Everybody knows Jackie Chan, right? Yeah. Worked with Jackie Chan on a comic book for Topps Comics called Spartan X, uh, which will be done at some point in time. Um, okay, next question. That's, that's just about it. Um, when you got into graphic design, did you, uh, back in, in, in the 60s, uh, did you uh, need to go to art school or did you just sort of fall into it? Um, now I, I, I fell into it. I see. Um, let me preface that by saying the world was a whole different place in the 60s. There's nobody here that old, okay, <laughs> except me, all right. Um, back in the late 60s, I did what the Australians call a walkabout. I just, I, I left home, 
dropped out of school. You didn't hear that. <laughs> um, and uh, basically traveled the country for a couple of years. And uh, to get gas in my motorcycle or food in my stomach or a place to live, I would do artwork for people. I designed tattoos. I uh, painted vans, surfboards, skateboards, um, which led ultimately to doing murals and storefronts. Uh, that's how I got into graphic design. From there it went to newspaper advertising, then it went to magazine layout and design, again the graphic design work. I've done very little commercial illustration, it's mostly design work. From there, I've done concept work for movies. I worked on Willow, uh, Childhood's End, all three, four versions of that. Um, then, over the past, like, say, five years, I've been doing design work for games. Um, websites, that sort of thing. Uh, that's that's my bread and butter job. Uh, I keep coming back to doing comic books or some version thereof only because I love to tell stories. And uh, in the course of doing that, I've had to learn how to do my job as a graphic designer better because I'm obsessive, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, and to do my job better, I had to learn how to draw. I learned how to have to had to learn how to write. Um, and uh, so I, I'm always bringing something something to the table. This is an industry. The whole multimedia industry is one of those places where they chew you up and spit you out by the time you're in your mid 30s. Uh, anybody will tell you that. It's rare that anybody lasts in this business as a functional, full-time participant past their mid-30s. Uh, some guys manage to make it to their 40s, but that's rare. I'm 65, that I've made it this far, and I still have people coming to me for work. I, it's, I'm, I'm a very privileged, lucky guy, and I know it. Uh, but it's because I've always brought something to the table. Is that, is that um, as well in graphic, is, I know you, you're, you're mentioning the, the comics, but is that the same thing with, with graphic design? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, and it's, it's like anything to do with multimedia. Oh, it's, really? I, yeah. I would think the graphic design, the novel, your, your experience would carry you, I would think. No, because here's how it works. It's all about money. Uh, after 9-11, here's an example. Immediately after 9-11, the bottom fell out of the commercial art industry because, for two reasons. Two reasons. The first reason is, is because all of the corporations in North America ducked and covered. They didn't want to spend money anymore. They didn't want to you know, they, they were afraid of the, the economy collapsing, and by virtue of that, they caused the economy to collapse. So when they started to get back into it and get back into the role and, and uh, realized that, you know, their businesses were failing and they had to, you know, advertise and, and do stuff, by then, the digital industry had built up. And they were finding kids straight out of high school or still in trade school who were Photoshop savvy. And these guys were just lifting stuff right off the internet. And they could do in an afternoon that it would take somebody like me a whole week to do. Now, not only was that cost ex expedient, but these guys were also getting paid dirt poor. You know, it's like, well, if you're going to do it in an afternoon, we're only going to pay you. X amount of money. Whereas I've been in the business for 50 years, 40 years, um, I, I'm going to want to get paid more, you know. Uh, and that's the case. I mean, if you have a, a long life in this industry, you're naturally going to be one of, it means that you're one of the better talents and that you're going to get paid more. 
well, the client's going to look at that and he doesn't really care. All he sees is his bottom line. And so a lot of work went to these guys who were straight out of high school. Uh, and that was the norm for a long time. It's been slowly changing back because they realized that the work they were getting is substandard. There was also a lot of copyright infringement because they were pulling stuff off the internet. Uh, so, you know, they were getting hit with lawsuits and all the money they were saving getting this stuff produced was going right back out to the lawyers. And uh, so it's slowly changing, but I'm no longer involved in that commercial aspect of it. I'm just doing the design work. I get paid a flat fee. Let somebody else do the do the footwork, and uh, that's something I learned. A lot of guys uh, were still trying to participate actively in the illustration and and layout area. All of them went under. Who are there any people that you're a fan of as an artist? Like, no, no. 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 That was the short answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the longer answer is that uh, despite as anal as my artwork tends to be, I'm actually more impressed by impressionists. Okay. Uh, I like Degas, Monet, uh, the, the, those guys. And in a, a current context, uh, I like guys like Jean Paul Lyon, uh, Sean Murphy, uh, Milton Kniff, you know, big sloppy brush line, yeah. you know. Uh, that they can think in those terms always impresses me. So that it, that's the longer answer, but it's not like I go out and collect any of this stuff. That's that's why I usually just say no. I, it's like when I look at it, I'll I'll be impressed, you know. But that's usually about as far as it goes. Uh, um, you said that you've done designs for video games, or yeah, yeah, which games? Halo, the first three Halo games oh, I worked cool. on. Yeah. Um, Sort of works sideways on um, Matarera's game, um, Battle Chasers. Um, worked on a couple of games that you probably have never heard of, uh, Frantic Ferrets. Oh, I worked on a couple of the Marvel game games. Um, That's the only ones that come to mind right at the moment. Uh, oh, uh, Pepe Moreno's games. His, uh, all three of his tank games, his um, uh, Normandy, um, Battlefield Europe, I think is what it was called. And then, oh, uh, it was a taxi game. Uh, crazy Taxi? Crazy Taxi, something like that. Yeah, Mad Taxi or something yeah, like that. Crazy yeah, Crazy Taxi. Crazy Taxi. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get involved That was actually kind of a weird little story. Uh, he asked how I got involved in Walking Dead. Um, Bob Kirkman is a really big fan of my stuff. Bob Kirkman created The Walking Dead, in case you don't know the name. Um, he grew up reading all my comic books, so he's a, he was a really big fan of my stuff. I didn't know this, by the way, until uh, I was working with Wizard shows, and uh, they were going to do a special promotional thing for The Walking Dead, like, I think, uh, what year is this? 2018. 2018. Okay, so five years ago. Uh, they did a special promotional thing, crossover promotional thing with The Walking Dead, where they wanted to produce variant covers for the Walking Dead comic book, the number one. And Bob Kirkman immediately evidently popped up and said, I want Michael Golden to do it, because I was attached to, I was working with Wizard on other things at the time. 
And uh, so I am the first artist to do the first variant for the first issue of Walking Dead. Thank you. Um, thank you. You're welcome. And uh, from then on, it exploded. AMC loved the stuff. Uh, I am the only artist who works for both the TV show and the comic book. Um, I've done concept work for the TV show, done merchandising for the TV show. Uh, several of my pieces have been uh, backdrops for the Talking Dead TV show. Uh, and for the comic book, I've done numerous variant covers and uh, a lot of their merchandising as well. Merchandising design, not their actual mer merchandising illustration. I'll take whatever they did in the comic book and then turn it into lunchbox, diapers, whatever. You know, like you want your baby wearing a, a walker. <laughs> okay. uh, it, it was, I will say, I will freely confess that when it was at its height, it was a, a cash cow. I was making money hand over fist with it. And it was always cool knowing how the episodes would turn out before everybody else did that. <laughs> Um, I know you mentioned that you were get, get, you just the paycheck thing, but have you ever been offered um, a, a, a percentage instead of a, a paycheck to work for um, something? And um, you know how some actors they're g given an option to take. Oh well, that's that's part and parcel of the deal. I was one of the first guys uh, to make Marvel give me a uh, creator royalty or a participation excuse me Marvel does not pay royalties uh, that's that's a common misconception uh, Marvel does not pay royalties they only pay incentives and participation uh, you see that brand new Camaro sitting over there yeah. that's a rogue check all right uh, pay cash for that thing all right um, yeah, it's, it's, but see, that's just it. Whenever I, you know, I, I tell everybody, it's like, look, you got to cover your, 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 cover yourself. You know, uh, if you want to work for page rate, go right ahead. I'm not going to stop you. Uh, but there's no money in it. It's like working for Burger King. You know, uh, you go in, you collect your paycheck, you get covered in grease, and you go home. Uh, you want to start your own restaurant, that's where the money's at. And you're either going to make it or break it. Yeah, I get I get my incentives and royalty checks. I get probably say fifty grand a year from DC on all the stuff that I've done with them. Uh, well, that's not impressive. I mean, George Perez is making you know six figures over from all the work that he's done for DC. I mean, he's living quite well. You know, he's a, he's a millionaire just by virtue of the fact of what he did for DC over the years. You know, uh, there are those guys that have made this industry pay for them. You know, Jim Lee being one of them. You know, he basically bought DC Comics, kind of a sideways sort of way. Uh, and that's all he ever wanted to do. First time I met Jim Lee when he was a kid, first words out of his mouth was, "All I want to do is draw Batman." Well, now he owns it, basically. <laughs> yeah, you know. co-publisher. Yeah, co-publisser, yeah. yeah. DC is paying him, you know, just because he's Jim Lee at this point, you know. So it works sometimes, but it's rare. And I, you know, like I said, okay, I threw out a money number there, but that's not impressive. I mean, it's it's you know, compared to the money that the companies are making off of these properties, it's, it's small change. You know, you'll hear them bitch and moan about paying creative people, you know, their fair percentage of these things, but you got to take it in context. I mean, they're making millions of dollars, you know, so. But you got you to gotta stand up for your rights and make it happen, and you got to do it ahead of the game, not afterwards. I mean, I, I do feel sorry for some of these guys that come in afterwards and say, well, I created that. You know, Marvel or DC owns me, owes me money for this. 
So I said, no, I'm sorry, man. You did it work for hire. You know, if you were concerned about it, you should have said something to begin with. And I say that to everybody else here too. You know, I don't know what you guys do for a living, but you know, if you want to make a pay on the back end, you got to say so up front, because otherwise you're giving it away. Is there any character? I don't mean to keep staying still on anybody's. Like, no, go right ahead. You were the only hand up. You're going. Any character you said no to? Like if they said, well, we want you to work on this character, you were like, no, I don't want to. Do actually, that. there have been several, but it's not been for. Well, actually, one of them was for Marvel, but um, uh, I won't do erotica or porn. Okay. Uh, and I have been asked many times by creators to do one or the other and I just won't do it I you know that's okay. I want I want all my work to be family friendly that's I think that that's well I also won't do gooey gore or anything like that it's I consider that infantile uh, you know it's like okay if you're into it fine does you the know. walking dead consider it's not a joke I'm just asking does the walking dead consider it family because well, yes, it is be the way I do it. Okay. Okay, and I told them that right up front. I'm not going to have decapitations and stuff like that. Uh, you know, active decapitations. You know, uh, what I mean by that is if they asked me to do a cover where a character was being decapitated, I won't do that. If it's a scene where there's a head sitting over on the side of the sh shot, and it's not the main focus of the storytelling, I don't have a problem with that because then it just becomes background, okay. you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, there's, there, there are artists, well, when Todd McFarlane asked me to do Spawn, now, you know, let's just be upfront. I mean, you know, Spawn is not family friendly by any stretch of the definition. All right, but I told Todd right up front, and, you know, it's like I'm not going to have, you know, I'm not going to be doing these shots where a character's getting his arm pulled out of his socket, you know, and there's not going to be blood spraying everywhere, or guts spilling on the floor, you know, if you want that, then you do it. And he did. He took my artwork and he did it. Uh, okay, that's his option. It's his character, it's his property. Um, but I didn't draw it, and I won't, because I just, I, I consider that, like I said, I consider that sort of stuff immature, uh, in, you know, uh, infantile, high school at best, uh, no offense to high schoolers, I mean, you know, <laughs> but you know, bathroom humor is, you know. Um, and for the most part, it's really not, just not necessary. I, I can't think of a storyline where <clears throat> that has been necessary. Uh, you know, I mean, you'll watch a, a movie like Braveheart, where people are getting their arms chopped off and everything, you know, during the course of a battle scene. That's necessary to the battle scene, and if you do it fast, quick, overdone with, well, okay, it's necessary to the, to the story. Uh, but, you know, like, you know, Friday the 13th movies, I, I consider those just totally socially irresponsible films. Uh, some people love them. You know, I'll, I'm not going to diss on somebody's likes or dislikes. I just probably won't ever have dinner with that guy, you know. Uh, you know, and... Uh, you know, uh, John Carpenter uh, and I are good friends. We've had dinner many times, and uh, you know, he's 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 known for his moments of of excess. Uh, but you know, I, it, in the right storytelling context, I you know, you just let it go. You know, the thing is a pretty gruesome movie, uh, but it's. It's so gruesome that it's over the top, and it's fast, it's quick, uh, 
and you almost kind of laugh at it sometimes. And that, in that context, it's like, okay, fine, you know. Um, but I, I, I won't do it. I won't even storyboard it. I don't know how how involved or how much you, you sort of follow the the comics now, just as, as an industry and as, as a whole. That seems like um, with certain companies, there's like a, a an over proliferation of publishing that they're putting out, and it seems like the talent level has watered down considerably. And I, I would say specifically more, um, you have people going the independent route. Um, or going to something like Image. Um, Marvel seems like they've put out a ton of books, as a, almost like a marketing campaign. Um, and I want to sit there and, like, as a fan, you want to buy them. Like, you, I desperately look through them. There's very few books that I really feel like are worth spending the money on. And I didn't know if you had any thoughts on the, the industry the way it is today at all. That's tied in with multimedia. The pause is me thinking of some sort of politi politically correct way of answering your question. Um, I'll qualify everything that I say beyond this point uh, with the same answer that I give about the Han Solo bar scene. Han Solo did fire first, okay? But it's not my toys, all right? Whatever Marvel and DC does is not my toys. It's not for me to criticize. Um, they've got some very talented people working for them. Uh, but this industry, the comic book industry in particular, but also, the music industry, the film industry now is just, uh, it's all about marketing, period. Um, Marvel has discontinued their creator incentives because of it. They're trying to just like make it all about exploitation the same way they were doing back in the 60s. And what they are doing in the process is exploiting the toys that they've already got. That's the only way I can say it, and I'm not sure I could say it any clearer than that. Um, do I have an opinion? That was, my, that was my opinion. It's like, it's not my toys, I don't care. Send me my check for the things that I created. I'm a happy camper. Right? I will shut up and I will play the game um, because I'm a businessman. It's not my, it's not my business. I, I'm not going to tell them what to do. But I do understand when fans come up to me and say, well, I don't like modern comic books. You know, they're dark, they're unreadable. You know, it's, yeah, okay, I understand that. Uh, so then don't buy them. <laughs> you know, uh, if you don't like them, don't buy them. You know, it's the same thing. I mean, how much of of Katy Perry can you stand? You know, how much? If you don't like it, don't buy it. I mean, money talks. I mean, that's 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 the good side and the bad side of capitalism. It's it's you know, capitalism is all about exploitation. It's all about getting product out there and telling you that you must have this, you want this, you need this. It's kind of up to you to pull back and go, no, not really, you know. Uh, no, I don't really need that, you know. And uh, that's what drives the marketplace. Marvel has lear learned back in the 90s that if they flood the marketplace with a million variants, a million gimmicks, people will buy it because they'll turn around and say, these are collector's items. You know, the collector market is what's destroying it. It's not, it's not the readers, you know, it's not, it's not even Marvel making these decisions. They're making these decisions based on the fact that somebody's buying this crap. 
and uh, they're just going to keep producing the crap. Is it uh, uh, maybe a fear of uh, uh, taking a risk in, in doing something like a new character or something? Is it a fear of losing the money, or when when they keep repeating just variants of the same thing or different versions? No, there's no fear involved. It's it's all about exploitation. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, you know, this worked this time, so let's just keep doing it. And, but they, 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 uh, I'm surprised that they wouldn't think that they could see even more of a profit if they just took a little bit more of a risk on something new. And then, and then well, that would be common sense. Um, when I was senior art director, I kept saying that. You know, it's like, well, look, you know, it's like, let's move this over here, you know, and do something that makes sense you know it's like no 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 no. we got we got this over here well let's just keep doing this um music is probably a, the best analogy a lot of people always focus on comic books well comic books is a very very small industry uh even though there is so much stuff exploiting comic books. Comic books themselves are just like this big, right? Uh, let's use the music industry, which is multi-mega billions of dollars. Who decided that rap music sells? Uh, yes, consumers. Really? Wrong. Hip-hop sells. Okay. Rap music is angry niche marketing. It's we want to get this certain group of people who are carrying all these chips on our, their shoulders. It's not music, folks. It is syncopated rhyme, but it's not music. What happened is they got a couple of guys who I won't name because you all know who they are, who did a couple of hit songs the angry crowd loved it, but nobody else was buying it, but the angry crowd loved it. And then the angry crowd got vocal. We want more of this. We want more of this. The producers are going, well, okay, that's not a problem. We can pull any kid off the street who can make a syncopated rhyme, and we've got rap music. Rap music was born. And now it's making billions of dollars, not because people are buying it, because, but because it's being marketed. You can now buy one song off the internet. And that's how they're doing it. They're feeding it to you in increments. And, you just, and they just keep selling it that way. You know, the same crowd is buying it over and over and over and over again. So that's how that industry got born and how it's perpetuating itself. There's a question, I see it. No, I was, well, I saw online that that rap music is apparently outsold rock, uh, I think it was last year or this yeah, year. Yeah. Uh, it's been around that long. Rap music's been a big marketing thing for, well, since the, the 90s at least. So it's it's been building its momentum. You're right, it has been. So, Taylor Swift is going to have to do a rap song. <laughs> Katy Perry already has done several of them, you know, so, and she didn't make a cent on it, probably. So. Um, no, Garth, Garth Brooks needs to do a rap song. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That's it. That's the next big thing. What would his new rap name be? Huh? <laughs> what, would, what would he change his name to be for a rap star? <laughs> uh, that would be fun. Well, yeah, we should. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Maybe he did that wrong. We should album. do a website. What is Garth Brooks' rap name? Yeah. Yeah. You were mentioning earlier about how, like after 9/11, how the industry changed, and when technology sort of swept in. Um, did you have to adapt to that at all? But become more oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's the only way you survive is by adaptation. Uh, that's why I said, you know, it's like 
as old as I am, I'm still bringing stuff to the table. I was one of the first guys to go digital. Uh, I helped set up uh, DC's digital art department back when computers still had hard drives that could be me only measured in kilobytes. You know, they were smaller than these things, all right? Uh, and I've been one of the exponents of, of digital ever since. I, I only work digitally unless the client asks me to do different. Um, you know, I taught myself Photoshop, I taught myself Illustrator, I taught myself uh, all of the, the printing setup programs, like Quark, which nobody uses anymore. Um, you know, you always got to be on top of it. You got to know this stuff. You got to be able to bring things to the table, and that's what keeps you alive in this industry. If you don't do it, if you want to, if you want to stand back and say, "Well, you know, I don't need that," or "I don't, uh, you know, I don't do it that way. I do it, you know, old school." I hate that word. Um, you know, if, if you if you dig in your heels, you know, they're going to roll right over you because there's always somebody right behind you that's going to take your place. Yep, adapt and survive. I know my question is simple, but uh, well, do you have like a certain product you were you were talking that you would say would be your favorite of them all? No, I don't have one. No, no. Um, as long as the check didn't bounce, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. And there's been plenty of times where the check bounced. Oh, yeah. Marvel for a long period of time, if they even bothered to send me a check, there was a good chance it wasn't going to clear. Yeah. What, what, when was this? Uh, in the 1980s. Okay. Yeah. You know, just before they went public and went actually bankrupt. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to call them up and go, oh, where's my check? Where's my check? They'd send me a check and then it wouldn't clear. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Uh, were there any uh, writers that you particularly enjoyed working with? Oh, yeah, there's several. Uh, Chris Claremont is my favorite writer, uh, but right right next to him is Gail Simone. Uh, both for the same reasons. They, they not only know how to write in the sense that they know how to structure a story, uh, but they're both Chris is probably the best dialogue writer I've ever worked with. Uh, you give him a picture and he will come up, he will put words in those characters' mouths that touch you deeply. He knows how to do this and he's very good at it. Gail knows how to write characters. Um, she seems to have an insight on so many different kinds. You know, she doesn't write just one or two characters, you know, and then make and adapts them to whatever story she's in. She actually has real different characters. Just saying, she is the one who created the current Deadpool. Okay? She didn't create Deadpool, but she's the one who made him a smart ass. All right? And nobody seems to remember that. She's the one who made Deadpool, the Deadpool that everybody knows now. Yeah, he was pretty dull. Yeah, he, yeah, he was. <laughs> he was a nonsense character. I mean, I, I drew him back then, so I mean, he was like a throwaway. Uh, she's the one who made him into the character that he is. She gave him character. Um, I like working with Larry Hama, um, only because he lets me do my job. Uh, he's a good. St he knows story structure. His <clears throat> portfolio of characters is very limited, probably to about three characters. Uh, but that's why we, he and I work well together, is because he'll just give me the bare bones of a story and then let me take it from there, and then he can fill in the gaps. Uh, that's why I like working with Larry. He, he lets me do my job. Um, I will not tell you the writers I do not like working for, <laughs> all right, because you're filming this. Uh, 
but those are those three are you know the guys I like working for I with excuse me uh, but I don't work much with writers anymore um, the collaborative experience uh, is really kind of no longer necessary like I said right at the top of this it's like if you just put something out there you got as good a chance as anything uh, but the under the qualifier to that statement the caveat as it is uh, is that you got to be whatever you put out there has got to have something that's going to click you know something that's going to get somebody's attention and I don't mean throwing gore all over the page or having big TNA going on. Uh, it's, you know, you gotta have a story. You know, you gotta have characters. Um, and they don't have to be great. You know, they just gotta be solid and consistent. I mean, I read the Harry Potter book, the first one, first episode, uh, the first book of Harry Potter took me three times to read it because it's the most god-awful, badly written piece of garbage I've ever read. Until I finally got through, through it the third time and I suddenly realized that she created characters that we all knew in high school. And that's what clicked with her readership, who were in fact young adults. They knew those kids. They knew Harry Potter. They knew Hermione Granger. And that's why that series became so popular to the point that they made movies out of it. Um, and the movies took off because now they saw on the big screen those kids that they grew up with. And it's been the same for every generation of kids that have watched those movies because we don't change. Human beings do not change. We're all the same no matter 6,000 years ago or yesterday. We're all this, we've always been the same. And uh, if you get that hook, if you get that character to click in somebody's mind as somebody they know, you've got them. You know, then, it's, then it's a successful property. That's the only, that's probably the only formula that works. But even then, that's not really a formula because you don't know what's going to click with somebody. You just tell your story and hope hope somebody identifies with it. Um, you said you worked for like you did art for like Harley Davidson that kind of things. Are you a fan? Do you ride motorcycles? Are you a fan? I was. I was a rider. Yeah. yeah. You were? yeah. So like, are you a fan of Harley Davidson or not? Like, That's the only scoot I ever rode. Okay. You know, you know, never never had anything else but. Um. <coughs> When and and when I write them, yeah. they look even bigger because I'm a little guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there any certain um, I don't want to say motivation, but it always seemed like the the things I remember the the covers for the Nam were always very striking. Like they were thank you really nice, um, and it wasn't it wasn't particularly a book that I I followed as much, but I always remember seeing the covers and. Um, that's you know part of the selling feature of a book is yeah. to look at it. It always compelled me to kind of well. That's why I was Marvel's cover artist for twenty years. Right. Yeah. yeah. Was there any certain with those? It just I don't want to say it seemed like you were hitting your stride, but for some reason those always were. I don't know. There was just something to them. I don't well, know thank you very any, much. I'm, I, I'm flattered. I don't know if there's any. There was a, a certain. Um, I don't know. Sometimes you work on a certain project and it just. Everything clicks and everything just goes really well. Um, I don't know if that would happen to be the case with that, or that's just my. No, it sounds like I did my job. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Glad you liked them. Yeah. To anybody like my job, I'm a CEO of a guy. I'm a, any, anyone who wants to become an artist, what advice would you give them? Learn everything. Learn everything. Okay, now what I mean by that is. I'm not saying that you have to be an expert uh, in anything in particular, um, but this is not just comic books, it's not just music, it's not just film, it's not just advertising design. This is multi, when I say multimedia, 
entertainment industry, it's everything, all right? Which means you kind of have to know everything or at least have an inkling of everything. Uh, a lot of people come up to my table and they've got their little portfolios and, and uh, they're showing me their artwork and they want to know how to make their artwork better and I'm going, no, I, I can't tell you how to make your artwork better. What I'm going to tell you is learn how to draw, learn how to paint, learn how to use a pencil. You know, uh, Computers only make your weaknesses worse because it makes you lazy. Uh, learn how to use watercolors. You learn color design. Learn basic anatomy. Learn basic perspective. Then learn computers. Learn your digital applications because Photoshop and Illustrator are just another tool. They're just another pencil. If you have a good solid basis in all these other skills, you'll understand that Photoshop and Illustrator are just more tools. Learn the basics of these things. Learn the basics of scripts. Learn how to tell a story. Because, and here's the reason why, like I said, this is not just one discipline anymore. It used to be, but it's not anymore. What you think you want to do now Let's say you want to be a penciler. May not be what you end up doing five years from now. What you think you're good at now, you know, you're a good draftsman, may not be what you're actually good at. You may find out down the road that you're good at something else. What you are good at may be completely useless five years down the road. Uh, and I can use my own experience as, as an example of this. When I came into the industry, I freely confess I wanted to be an artist, okay? I wanted to paint and draw wonderful pieces of artwork. I stink at it. All right, took me a while to figure it out, but I stink at it. Uh, I am no good at all on personal expression in my art. Um, I couldn't write to save my life. It took me several years of understanding that my strong points are two things. One, I have a really good ability to tell a story. My mother used to just call me a little liar, but you know, <laughs> it works, okay? As long as the end product keeps me from getting smacked across the head, I'm good. My second strong point was that I have a really good sense of color and design. And that pulled me through a lot of jobs that otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do. But I eventually figured out that I am not an artist. I am a storyteller. That's what I do, and that's what I do well. At which point I started to turn around and gear everything that I was learning and what I had to do toward that end of telling a story. And uh, since then I've been, you know, now I know how to write. I know, you know, I was an editor. Uh, I could direct kittens from point A to point B. Um, you know, I, what I'm doing now, I would have never, 40 years ago, I would have never thought that this is what I'd be doing and this would be my focus. And that's what I tell people. You know, it's like, what you think you want to do now, go for it. But it may not be what you're doing five, ten years from now. Keep your doors open. Learn a little bit of everything. Make sure you're bringing something to the table every time, you know, you're looking for work because the real solid indisputable truth of this industry is there's always somebody right behind you who's going to take your place you know who's chomping at the bit you know who's got a knife poised right at the back of your head and uh, you got to keep that in mind you know and uh, right now in like say at Marvel and DC 
to answer your question, actually, to come back to your issue, is you'll notice that a lot of the people who are working for Marvel right now are Eastern European or South American. I'm not going to diss on their ability. Some of them are actually very talented people. But the reason they're doing that is because Marvel and DC are getting them for a song. You know, uh, Page rates are now back to what they were ba back in the, the 1970s. And... Uh, With or without inflation? Either or. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, they're now... Starting rates at Marvel are now below $100 a page. Uh, you know, uh, you've got to turn out four or five pages a day just to make a living, and that's bare bones. I mean, that's if you're sharing an apartment with somebody else. You know, uh, it's it's you know, but that's a that's a reality of the business, you know? and you have to understand that going in. Okay, I think we're getting pretty, Just yeah, we're done. Uh, is there any other uh, questions? Just talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 Niagara Falls Comic Con. Please like, comment, and subscribe to see more. And let us know below what you think of this video. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.